Well, hello and welcome to another Talk Wildlife Skype interview. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of talking to Tim Storr. Tim Storr is a trustee of Plant Life in the UK. Um, however, it's not that I'm going to be talking to him about today. I'm going to talk to him about his role as uh, the chair of an Indian Indonesian foundation that is responsible for Hutan Heropan. Is that right? Is that pronounced right? Right. Excellent. Uh, which is in Sumatra and we'll sort of broaden on that as we go through. But first of all, hello, Tim. Welcome to Talk Wildlife. Hello, Alan. Yes, thank you for uh, the opportunity. How are you doing? All right. Yes, yeah, fine. Thank you. Good, good. So I know you're not uh, in Sumatra at the moment. You're in sunny-ish Norfolk, aren't you? Indeed, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I had to look out the window just to check whether it was still sunny-ish. Yeah. It's much colder here. I'd rather be in Sumatra. Yeah, well, it's bizarre because Saturday it was like 20 odd and now today it's like 8 or 10. It's ridiculous. But such is life, it's only April. Yeah. So what I think we'll do is, um, this is this is a really fascinating project. And if I'm right, it was the model that was used for bird life when they actually set up their Forest of Hope um projects uh, so i know it's a first which you'll tell us about uh, a first of its type in indonesia um but i think what we'll do is we'll just go straight into it so i think i'll share screen because we've got some excellent uh, images to share as well and then we'll just have a chat about the project in general and then talk about the wildlife maybe a bit later sure that'll be good right so i'll just share screen Right, so uh, I've already mentioned this is in Sumatra. So if you want to give us a little bit of background to sort of whereabouts it is and also give us an idea of what kind of sort of habitat we're talking about here and what kind of landscape, that would be great. OK, so um, this is imagine imagine yourself in a in a in the middle of a tropical rainforest in very humid, very warm conditions. It's likely not windy. It's going to rain later in the afternoon. Uh, the temperature is going to peak around 35 degrees or more, but it's going to be nice and cool in the forest. So you, you're, you're in this amazing, absolutely amazing forest. This is located in Sumatra. Sumatra is an island, one of many islands of Indonesia in Southeast Asia. So you're around seven and a half thousand kilometers from the UK and you're um, in one of the last remaining fragments of a really special type of, of forest that's only found in this particular island of Sumatra in Indonesia. Um, the views over the existing forest are incredible. Um, this is taken from our project area, which is called the Harapan Rainforest, or in Bahasa, Hutan Harapan. Harapan is the Indonesian Bahasa word for hope, so it's forest of hope. And as Alan said, it's, it's part of the uh, BirdLife International Forest of Hope program. And it is one of the uh, last remaining remnants of this type of forest left in the world and in this part of Sumatra. Um, again, uh, a little bit of background on the forests um, in, well, this applies to the whole of the zones of tropical forests across the world, but in particular in Indonesia, there's been huge problems with deforestation, but there are pockets that are left that haven't been felled. Um, those are extremely rare and our project is situated in a landscape of lowland forest that has actually already been logged. So many of the pictures you've just seen, which were of Harapan, were actually of a forest where the tallest trees had already been taken out. Uh, much of the area of lowland Sumatra had been covered in extensive forests, uh, which the Indonesian government licensed to the logging companies, they took out the largest trees 
and then they return the licenses back to the government when they'd finished their logging operations. Uh, many cases, this is one, they didn't fell absolutely everything. So they left uh, what is still a very impressive forest. Yeah, yeah. Is it worth showing the map? Because um, I know we've got maps. Is it worth showing that just to give people a, a, an idea of the extent of the logging? Yeah, so if we look at the map, this is the map of the forests of Sumatra in 19, around about 1900, so 120 years ago. Um, and it was largely completely forested, as you can see. The pale forest on the east is a swamp forest. This is peat-based, incredibly high carbon uh, value in, in these forests, but not just from the trees, but from the peat it's on as well. The yeah. shade of green on the west is the montane forest. A lot of that has still survived. It's in the mountains, less easy to, to fell, but it's the darkest green in the middle of the island and on some of the islands offshore. The lowland, dry lowland forest that is the really, really important stuff. Some amazing trees, amazing habitat. And if you look at the next map, this is how much is left around about the year 2000. And if we had a similar map now, most of the dark blobs uh, north of the Harapan rainforest have disappeared as well. So we're probably talking about now one third or one half of the remaining forest this type in the world, and it's found in this part of Sumatra. So that's how scarce and how important this particular project is. It's, it's absolutely devastating. And I mean, yeah, we're going to talk about your project, but if you look again, you know, are we saying that that's, there's this been the same type of destruction for the other two um, forest types there? Well, the, the, the swamp forest is more or less all gone. Um, a lot of that's been converted to palm oil production or swamp uh, or shrimp uh, production in, in, in the offshore areas. Uh, and they've, they've actually done some of that actually in the old bits of the forest. Um, but the, and the montane forest has, has fared best, if you can call it that, though even that's been quite severely destroyed. And you'll probably recall that there was a new species of orangutan uh, described from Sumatra that was up in the north in those green uh, areas in the north of the island. Um, and um, so that you know, again, that's a really important bit of forest. But the dark green in the middle, 97 percent of that had gone when we started the project. Ninety seven percent had gone. So it's probably closer to 98 to 99 percent now. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's it it really is. When you see it like that, it's just devastating. Yeah. So, so I'm not going to dwell on that too much then. So, um, but let's just so you know, uh, Harapan Rainforest. I believe. Um, in, am I right in saying that it's um it's this ecosystem restoration model that's it's a first for Indonesia. Is that right? So what? So what? What happened? It's worth. It's worth just telling the story because you've got to give some credit to the Indonesian government for for, for a lot of this as well. So around about 2000, when the plight of this these forests in Indonesia, and particularly in Sumatra, was brought to the attention of BirdLife International, um, the, the 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 great and good of BirdLife International decided that something had to be done. We couldn't simply just see the rest of this forest disappear, and the organization that in, in Indonesia called Burung Indonesia, Burung uh, being Bahasa for bird, so Burung Indonesia um, had identified uh, the last remaining bits of the this particular uh, e e dry lowland forest and had prioritized this one area which is ringed on the map there uh, for, uh, for a possible project to save it and then came the challenge of working out how to do it. Indonesian government owns the land in Sumatra and it leases these blocks of forest to logging companies. And the, the ruse that we came up with was to get the Indonesian government to change the terms of the license uh, from a logging license where the holder had to fell the trees within 21 years or return the, the license to the government to what became known as an ecological restoration license, 
where we still have to return the, the, the forested area back to the government, but not for 90 years and hopefully with a restored forest. So they haven't changed the underpinning uh, rationale for owning the land or managing the forest, but they've created this new type of license, new type of concession. And the RSPB, the BirdLife Partner in the UK, Burung Indonesia, BirdLife Partner Indonesia, and BirdLife International, the confederation based in Cambridge, got together and purchased the least the two licenses for the Harapan rainforest. It wasn't called Harapan then, we gave it that name and uh, that's how the project started in 2002. And um, we eventually got the license to the first half in 2007 and to the second half in 2010. It took quite a long time to get these things transferred. Yeah. Um, and together they amount to about 100,000 hectares, 98,500 hectares. So give you a clue how big that is, that's roughly getting on for the size of London inside the M25, if, if you're a southerner and that's relevant to your geography, geographical understanding. But yeah. you and me, it's big, it's very big. <laughs> it is, I mean, it, you know, it is big and it's, um... You know, it's great now that it's been protected. Um, in the context of that, you know, it's it's clearly small, <laughs> but yeah. it, it is a you know, it's a, a very positive and very um, worthwhile project, and, and and obviously you know, critical because with all of that gone, this is really, as it as it states, this is the last hope. This is you know, this is for yeah. some species, you know, this is the only place they've got left. Yeah. So, and, and changing the regulation uh, under the forestry legislation, uh, the, le the regulations don't just apply to Sumatra, they apply to the whole of Indonesia. And this has allowed other people to get to apply for and to receive uh, these ecological recession, uh, restoration concessions for other parts of Indonesia. So this was a, this was a you know, pioneering change uh, groundbreaking in that, um, that what what was happening was everything was getting failed. Now there's at least um, 16, I think it is 16 concessions already up and running elsewhere uh, in Indonesia to try to protect and restore the bits of forest that haven't been completely obliterated, which is just fantastic. It is, yeah. Definitely. And the Indonesian government had set aside at least 4 million hectares. We've only got 100,000, but they've set aside 4 million hectares to um, operate under this new license so that other people can apply to get uh, to lease it and to restore it. So it's it is really uh, you know, a, a matter of hope that we can prevent all this forest from disappearing. Yeah. And. and we will come on to talk about the project next, but just before we do, what, what's the, because um, obviously we hear a lot about palm oil and palm oil uh, plantations and deforestation as a result and, and all the rest of it. How has this been accepted? Not not by the, the direct local community, because we'll talk about them in a second, but, you know, ha has this been, ex uh, you know, accepted? Is it safe, this land? You know, it, is there any ex still existing threats? What's been the attitude towards it in, in Sumatra? In the, um, the government is supportive. Uh, it's, it's been recognised as part of the Indonesian uh, uh, contribution to uh, mitigating climate change. Um, it's been discussed at the highest levels all around the world, all the, the UNFCCC talks and so on. So it's, so it's on the radar as being a model for trying to protect the last remnants of forest. Um, so, so there's, gov there's widespread government support uh, at that level. Uh, where it becomes challenging, and you'll see when we get on to talk more about the project, is at the local and community level, where there is uh, a shortage of land for many of the local people across the Indonesian archipelago, and there are inevitably 
uh, disagreements or conflicts around how that land should be used. Yeah. And the project has, has definitely suffered from people wanting, not unreasonably wanting, to find somewhere to live and, and, and you know, grow crops and feed themselves. Um, but it has, that has been quite a struggle and it remains so in many other parts of, of Indonesia or indeed throughout the forested areas. Yeah, yeah. Right, so if we start talking about the project now, uh, if you give us a, uh, you, you've given us a little bit of background about the licenses, etc. But um, let's talk about the project. What, what is actually being done on a day-to-day -day basis in that area? Yeah, so there's a, there's a map of the two concessions together um, and you can see the dark green is the most important bits. That's the best forested area. It's largely secondary forest, as I've said, but we'll yep. come on later to talk about the wildlife that's in it. The pink areas on the north and the, and, and the east, these are the areas where by the time we inherited or we, we, we were able to, to get hold of the licenses, the communities had already moved in and started to set up uh, settlements and farm the land themselves. Um, so we have not uh, objected to that. They're, they're in the forest and they will stay there and we'll work with them. And then the areas in paler green, uh, again around the right hand side, right hand side, the eastern side and the ring, those are areas where um, there's been a lot more cooperation between the project and local people where we're hoping that we can work with them to prevent them encroaching further. Uh, but we have some of that area has been encroached and some of it has also been badly burned in recent fires. Again, we'll, we'll come on to that. And then the, just out of interest, the orange areas down in the south, those those blocks, they're actually um, acacia plantations that were put in um, many years ago before we, we we got hold of the licenses and um, those those are gradually just dying out as the trees mature and fall over and we are anticipating that ultimately we'll be able to reconvert that back to forest right and so acacia plantations is the acacia native there or were these no these are these are introduced acacia is one of the fastest growing timbers and it it, it, it produces grows incredibly well out here and it, it it grows dead straight produces lots of tree lots of timber uh, which is used in the pulp industry and and um there's a very good market for it uh and it's rather different from the rest of the forest which of course are all hardwoods very slow growing though i mean quite quite for the tropics they grow quite quickly but um, but it still takes a lot longer to grow and then most of what you most, most of the white surrounding the project is most of it but not all of it is oil palm plantations which from a wildlife perspective are I don't think it's unfair to call them a, a bit of a, an ecological desert they are a, they are a monoculture where all other vegetation is removed to the absolute minimum and very few of the birds or mammals that have survived in the forest, the natural forest, can survive in an oil palm plantation. So really is an island in a sea of oil palm largely. Yeah, right. And if I can just go back to, so you can just go for a minute. The, the previous time there's a there's a list of things down on the right hand side there on of the screen so we got the licenses as i've said we then uh, drew up a land use plan we started to work on a community agreements with the uh, with the settlement the settlers in the pink areas um we obviously needed some sort of vision of where we were going and we used that to get uh, funding uh from any sources we could We've said there um, carbon, uh, that actually has been the one source of funding we haven't been able to access uh, for complicated reasons, but, but there is no funding from RED or any other carbon related mechanism um, in, in you know, coming directly through the Indonesian government. Um, and we are still desperately trying to find non-timber forest products, the 
bit of bit of jargon there, but basically products that we can market from the forest that don't involve cutting the trees down. So, for example, an obvious example would be honey, but there are other things that we can we can get other fruits and uh, rubber and so on that we could get from the forest. And all these are to try there to try to generate an income. And, and generating an income is one of our biggest challenges, as is preventing further encroachment and fires, which is probably the other big challenge for the project. Right, right. And the, the pink areas that you mentioned, is that where the uh, Batin Sembalan have settled? Is, is that no. when it's talked about sort of community moving it? Is that is that where they are or are they spread more wide than that? No, this is this is so the Batin Sembalan are a, are a fascinating um, I, uh, semi indigenous native peoples. Um, this is a camera trap image taken in 2009 and you can see there's a man there barefoot carrying a couple of spears who is actually out hunting for food. And when we first started uh, you know, working in the forest before we even got the licenses. We obviously knew that these communities lived in, in the forest. I don't think we fully understood the scale to which or the, the degree to which they were still operating uh, in, a, in a lifestyle that hadn't changed for probably hundreds of years. Um, so this, this community lives in the forest uh, they, their settlements are in the forest, they're, they're pretty low key, they're very, in our terms, they're incredibly poor, but they were getting all they needed for their livelihoods from the forest. Yeah. Then the loggers came along and disrupted all that, but fortunately a lot of the wildlife that they need, the, the small like, mammals and the, uh, to hunt and the, and the fruits and the timber and the plants, all the rest of it, much of that remained after loggers went and we have been very keen to work with them to continue allow them to continue their lifestyle in the forest un, unimpeded by us um, and actually supported by us because yeah. they are as dependent on having this forest as we are yeah yeah it, it, it's sort of quite important that because you know, you've got indigenous people that live in these areas and the last thing you want to do is go and completely disrupt their lives because we're saying, no, we need to turn it over to wildlife. Uh, they know more about the wildlife and have been living in that sort of environment for a lot longer than we have. So, you know, to, to keep that balance, and they always have kept the balance from my understanding, um, you know, to keep that balance, I think is really important. Yes, they have. Um, and um, unfortunately, one of the the difficulties that we have faced is the the Batin Sembalan are you know were, were quite um, in a way quite content to live in the forest in the type of existence they'd always had. Meanwhile, around them in the areas of white I showed you on the, on the map I showed you earlier, yeah. you have incomers, some from Sumatra, but many from Java, the very heavily populated main island of Indonesia. People were moved across to Sumatra when Sumatra, when Java kind of was running out of space. And these people settled in Sumatra. They were paid by the government small amounts of money to settle there. And they have lived there and found their livelihoods and they've raised their children who now want places to live. And you have a, a quite a challenging situation developing where you've got very um, relatively well educated, uh, you know, technologically savvy um, Javanese people, Indonesian people living in Sumatra who are coming up, up in, in, in juxtaposition to other people who live in Sumatra whose way of life hasn't changed much in the last hundred years and and you can imagine the kinds of conflicts and the kinds of difficulties and issues that, that, that arise. So what we have done uh, as part of the project is to try to support these these indigenous people um, to educate them, to provide them with better health facilities, to get 
proper sanitation. I mean, to start with, just clean, clean drinking water, but obviously all the other facilities as well. And, and build these facilities for them as part of the project in the village, in their villages, in the forest to, to, to help sustain them. Um, because as you say, they, they don't present any threat to the future of the forest. In fact, they probably are going to be helpful in ensuring its survival. And where possible, where possible we've, we've employed them as workers in the project. Excellent. Excellent. Speaking of which, the project. Yes. So um, the project is uh, based around the old headquarters of the logging company in one of the concessions um, in a in a sort of little village on the on the edge. And at any one time, we've probably got 200, 220 staff uh, on the on the payroll. Um, some of them will be, as the image shows here, working in the tree nurseries or the nurseries for the, the crops of rubber or other, other plants that we might put in the forest. Some are, uh, are used on the firefighting activities. As you, there's a picture on the other side shows the, somebody being going through a training program. We use the logging roads that were in the concession <laughs> to get around sometimes yeah, um, that, that looks like somewhere in Norfolk no no <laughs> that, yeah that's a bit of a challenge but just just yeah. pause a minute on that that picture which you know, shows you people you know trying to get a vehicle out of the mud but if you look at the trees behind uh, you can see how tall they are in yeah. relation to the people in the image now, now this is secondary forest this is yeah. forest the biggest trees have already been taken out so to an untrained eye, this looks like a monumentally tall forest, even though we know it's not, it's not in its pristine state. So the project team go around through the forest on these forest tracks, and we do a lot of patrolling to stop illegal felling of trees, uh, and other encroachment activities. Um, we have suffered quite a lot with the conflict between people's natural desire to find somewhere to live and to farm and our desire to try to keep the forest intact and help it recover. Uh, we can't offer enough well-paid jobs to compete with, for example, growing oil palm. Um, it, 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 the economics are not in our favour and that is a real challenge to us. Yeah. Where I think we are making much better progress is with these uh, nature schools that we've set up. This is a this is an outdoor classroom, as you can see quite clearly, um, where we're teaching the the, 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 the children about the forest um, and about the, um, the the things that they would need to know that aren't in the forest actually to help them uh, you know, cope with life in the in the in the twenty first century. Um, and we've built a couple of classrooms, we've built a clinic, um, we've actually uh, paid for the nursing staff as well to, to help improve the, the, the health of the community. Um, but these are, these are this is just a relatively small contribution in the, in the bigger picture in Indonesia and, and we are, uh, I wouldn't want to overstate how much we're doing here, it's, uh, there's an awful lot of people around us. Yeah, and, and the nurseries, I, I noticed this earlier on, um, is this sort of regrowth for the forest? Well, this is this is interesting. So so we've we've been funded by generously funded by uh, a series of international donors started off with the European Union, uh, then the German government through its climate change programme uh, helped to fund us and the Danish government through Danida, its development agency, and now again the the german government and they are the, the money they're putting in is to help to restore the forest uh and to mitigate the impacts of climate change um and obviously the biodiversity goes with it but they're many of their primary targets were around uh, protecting the resource for the carbon 
and we've looked into the best ways of actually re-establishing the forest where where we've either lost the forest cover completely through a fire or encroachment or where we've um, not got the right mix of trees because some were selectively felled yeah. and we've experimented with quite a lot of these nurseries um, where you you can you, know, you can grow a tree really very quickly and then go and plant it out in the forest um, but in some circumstances it's actually as quick to allow the forest to regenerate naturally uh, but of course it depends on what species you're after because natural regeneration generally is only what's there already and sure. if the, the seed source has already been taken away and isn't in the soil it often isn't in the tropics then you need to put some of these other species back so you've got probably about 120 odd species of tree being of, of different species 120 different species of tree have been planted in the forest now right right and then harvesting the, the I noticed uh, there was uh, is this cork on the this is this is rubber rubber harvesting uh, on on the left there you can see um, yeah. and uh, we've been trying to encourage uh, what's called jungle rubber so this is the production of of the, the, the gathering of the latex from the bark of the trees uh, with the trees in the forest already not in the not setting up plantations uh, we, we, we can't create a rubber plantation because uh, it's a it's a it's a restoration forest so that, yeah, rubber plantation is a is a, an agricultural production um, so we've we've encouraged uh, the local communities to harvest the rubber for the trees that already the rubber trees that already exist and we planted a lot more trees we've also uh, encouraged people to harvest other types of things so rattan uh, fruit rattan wood for example um, which can be can be used we've, we've got honey production um, we've been looking at something called argo wood or gahara wood which is a which is an oil that you create from the um, decaying inner part of certain species of tree which is actually incredibly valuable it's it's probably weight for weight more worth more than gold i mean it is incredibly valuable product right and uh, what's that used for it's used in incense and perfumery and and um it's it's sort of uh it's, it's, it's um, production is heavily controlled and the trees from which it comes are listed under CITES, the trade, international trade regulation, to prevent them uh, being commercially exploited except under proper license conditions. So it's quite, you know, there's some, there are some products in the forest that are actually extremely valuable. Um, the challenge for us though is at the moment the income sources from this are nowhere near matching the needs of the project uh, in terms of revenue expenditure. So we, we're we still dependent on these big, and dependent and very grateful, these big grants from the latest being the German government through its key climate programme. Yeah, and clearly a lot of projects, a lot of conservation projects make uh, additional money out of sort of ecotourism. So what is ecotourism like for you? I mean, I've taken a few uh, these pictures from your website. Um, yeah. Yeah. I know it has its challenges because you mentioned that. So could you tell us about the ecotourism there? So, so I, I, I saw your program uh, with Alan Martin, who was indeed another a trustee of the uh, Indonesian Foundation here, a, a, a program on Regua, where they are they have done an incredibly good job at making ecotourism fund quite a lot of the operation um and that's that's absolutely fantastic uh we have got a little bit more of a challenge and i think it falls into maybe two to th two or three reasons um one of the reasons for uh people coming to see wildlife is the, it, sounds, it sounds very obvious but they can see it uh, you go to Africa to see lions, you go to northern India to see tigers, and if you get there, you have a reasonable expectation of seeing those megafauna, those big animals. 
And indeed, when you go bird watching in regular, you have a very good chance of seeing a couple of hundred species of birds. If you come to Harapan at the moment, you're highly unlikely to see any mammals whatsoever, other than the kitchen cat. Um, and uh, you're also very unlikely to see many of the interesting, hard to see or endemic birds because they are very hard to see in this type of forest. Uh, so it, it's quite to see them. It's quite a specialist um, operation. So so, the, the, so our, our market, if you like, is quite small. That's the first problem. Uh, the second problem is access. Um, which you can fly from Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, to Jambi, and then it's a three hour drive down to the forest, down some rather rough and not particularly pleasant roads. Uh, and there is some basic accommodation in the forest. Um, but we, we, we are not well set up at the moment to have international visitors. We are getting increasing numbers of local people coming not so much to come specifically to see the wildlife, but actually just to see a forest. Yeah. Then the yeah. local people are living in areas surrounded by palm oil, just the seas and seas of, of oil palm trees. And these patches of what the forest once looked like and how tall it was and what it's like to look over it, you can see we have a tower there uh, which if you're brave enough, you can climb up that ladder to the platform uh, and you can look over the forest. And one of the pictures we first showed in, in this discussion was a picture from the platform. So yeah. local people uh, from, from the island of Sumatra are coming in increasing numbers. Children are coming. There's a great schools program. Um, there's an awful lot of interest, uh, but it's not um able to generate the kind of funds that we need uh, at the moment you know, in time it might do but uh, it's uh, that's uh, that's a possibility that this will grow i'm i'm hopeful yeah and, and i suppose you're in a bit of a catch-22 with the access because of course if you improve access then you're not sure who else you're opening it up to other than the park workers and the people that come to visit the park for the right reasons. Um, would that, do you think, be a problem if you were to improve access to the park? I, I don't think that would be the issue. I don't think the, I think if you opened up the access, um, then it would, it might have a, a small effect, but I think there's, there's plenty of people who are, who are in and around the park, who are, you know, or the park, sorry, around the, the, the concession, who are, um, who are who are able either to look after it or, or in some cases trying to exploit it and unfortunately um uh, i don't think it will make much much difference to, to that but it's it's um what i think we would really need is a, a sort of more dedicated operation where you have um you know peep staff who are there to solely to deal with the visitors yeah um, and that would mean that your costs would go up and and obviously if you put your costs up there's less profit as it were to go and fund the rest of the operation but we're certainly hoping that that will improve and at the end of this uh, the, the current funding we have from the german government it, it will it lasts for seven years another six to go when that ends it's highly unlikely we will get any more funding so from them or anywhere else so we will then need to be much more closely to being self-sufficient so that's our really big challenge right and just to add i have been up the tower twice and it's fantastic <laughs> have you, uh, well do you know what i was looking at i was thinking would i and i was thinking yep i surely would <laughs> yeah it's all kitted out with all the safety gear so you know if you fell off at the top you'd you'd be held on you couldn't you know you can't hurt yourself but it's uh, in the uh, what makes it even a little bit more challenging, I suppose, is uh, is it's really hot. So when you get up to the top, you discover your hands are really sweaty. And of course, when you've got wet, slippery hands, they don't kind of grip so well. So you think, oh, dear, this is, this is a little bit. Uh, it gets hairier as you go up. But when you're up there, it's well worth it. Oh, too right. Yeah. Yeah, I would. Uh, I, yeah, definitely. I'd go up there. Um, now, just before we come on to sort of talking about the wildlife that is hard to see, which, uh, you know, you, 
it might be hard to see, but it is there. And, it, you know, you, you quoted on your website as having sort of 55 species of mammal, uh, about 305 species of bird quoted on bird life, uh, 38 reptile species, 20 odd amphibian species. So the wildlife is there, um, just difficult to see. Um, so we'll come on to that in a second, but I, I know that, you know, in, in sort of 2019, you had a, a, a serious issue with, with fire. Can you just give us an idea of just what happened? Yeah, so, um, so this was a combination of things that all worked uh, to cause a bit of a, a disaster in part of the forest. Fortunately, not in the core area. This was on the area to the to the east of the of the concessions, um, an area that had already been partly encroached. Um, but nevertheless, it was very serious. It had been a very dry period leading up to this event. Um, uh, each year, the, you know, there's a seasonal rainfall pattern, and in the in the dry season. Um, there's always a risk of fires, which is why we have a, a fire team and we train people, our staff, how to, you know, how to deal with the fires safely, getting the, all the PPE and all that sort of stuff. But 2019, uh, I think the, the El Nino uh, effect meant that there was a very, very dry period in Indonesia, across the whole of Indonesia, and in particular in Sumatra. And several places either were deliberately set alight by uh, um, settlers trying to clear ground or could easily have been set alight inadvertently by somebody throwing a cigarette match away from their motorbike or even you know a, a bit of glass or some other cause you know in the intense heat and the very very dry ground covered in masses of dead leaves dry it's just like tinder yeah and this fire took hold and raged and it covered i think almost 4000 hectares of forest um or 4000 hectares of, of the land within the forest as i say some of it was not all forested land but as you can see from the pictures the trees that were burned were still significant trees and um we were fortunate in that the indonesian government helped um to deal with this and uh indonesia had come under had come in for some considerable criticism in previous years for uh the fires that rage in sumatra every year and the winds blow them over to singapore and and that shuts down the singapore airport and causes problems for breathing uh the air quality in 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 singapore and other bits of malaysia so Indonesia was under quite a bit of pressure to stop this happening. And the president, the current president said, you know, that, that, you know it, it, it must stop and deployed the military to make that um, happen, which was great. But in this instance, the, um, you know, the fires happened before anybody could get into the position to, to, to reduce their impact. And we were left with having to deal with the after effects so um we've got a lot of help from the military and from the police to try and resolve the situation and then we thought that well we we've got to try to make good the the forest so we started to plant trees again in the in the burnt area but much of the forest will actually regenerate naturally um in, in areas particularly with these areas this is un, unlike the peat forest you can see in the in the picture there the soil the soil is sandy and dry and, mm -hmm. and fire doesn't go down into the soil unlike in the peat swamps where it can do yes. does so much more damage so the fire can go right the way through these areas really quickly in some areas the trees are left standing they're burnt, but they're left standing. These ones, obviously, are less. It's been, it's been even. It's been more damaging. But so it will regenerate. But it, it's another kind of setback that we could have done without. So obviously, we don't want to see this happen again. So we're busy still working on ways in which we can we can re-establish the forest, but also to do things that prevent people wanting to set fire to it in the first place. And part of that is education. But part of that is also giving them other livelihoods or other means of, of, of reasons for wanting to see the forest grow and not uh, not chop it down. 
so it's a bit of a tragedy but uh, like all these things there's there's benefits to be had if you look hard enough yeah yeah so and we'll come on to the wildlife now and obviously we've we've spoken beforehand about sort of getting hold of some photographs and things like that some of these are from the website some of them from your own presentation lots of them are from camera traps it actually harks back to two things that you've already said which number one is the wildlife's hard to see and number two because you haven't got um if for one of the better phrase a lot of people coming for the eco tourism um there's not that many photographs actually available uh, if you think of somewhere like Regula, you know they, they've got ecotourism and, and they've got the wildlife and they've got loads of people going to take photographs so a lot of what we've got here has sort of been from your website but from camera traps which actually i find equally as fascinating as any photograph somebody might have gone out and, and purposely set up a hide for or sat in a tree waiting to take so first of all we, i've got these three pictures of birds i don't, don't know whether you want to put names to them before we start sure Sure. Yeah. So the, the 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 one at the top is um is a kingfisher. Um, it's a, it's a it's a tiny kingfisher. It's smaller than ours. It's a it's a rufous backed dwarf kingfisher. Um, um, it's a stunning little bird. Um, uh, mainly I think in Harapan found in the damper areas. But many of the kingfishers, unlike ours, which which live solely around water many of the kingfishers live in areas with, which are dry yeah. um, so that's the little chap at the top on the bottom at the, at the right hand side you've got a woodpecker um, so he's a, he's a, a stunningly colorful he's crimson winged woodpecker um, one of perhaps four or five species of woodpeckers you can see in the in the in the forest yeah. and then the the jewel in the crown as it were is the the, the blue and red bird is a, is a pitter the garnet pitter. Now those those are really quite hard birds to see. And many of the bird watchers who come to Southeast Asia, pitters will be on their top of their wanted list. Yeah, these are the these are the colourful ground dwelling uh, secretive gems that any you know any bird watcher you want to go and find those before anything else. Um, now, as I mentioned, you know, if if we were in a position where we had sufficient staff to go out and find these birds and where the best places to see them were and then we could get to those places and take people then it would be a lot easier and at the moment um, we can show them lots of more widespread birds but you you're they're, they're not birds that are particularly um difficult to see in sumatra but uh, as for the camera the camera traps though then that's i think that's a different story and and yeah. the the story there is really around uh, what you what you can find when they don't believe you're watching them. So um, so uh, yes, we've got a few images here which might be you know, maybe we could share and just talk through because um, uh, these are images that are taken, you know, when the wildlife doesn't think anybody else is watching. These these birds are uh, types of pheasants. These are crested fire sorry crestless firebacks um walking through the forest and uh generally um hunting in small groups one of several species of pheasant that are found uh, on the on the forest floor and um they're about chicken size they're quite large um and uh we've also had birds like the great argus which is which is quite a rare bird yeah um, photographed on these traps you'll notice this trap the photo photograph is in in daylight um quite a lot of our best images um are in daylight but one or two others come at night when you discover what's really going on yeah so uh, no so there's five birds in there is that a family group or are they a sort of you know are they a communal bird you know why so many in one picture um, i don't i don't know the answer to that question um it might be a family group. Uh, it seems probable, uh, but it might be more than one family. I don't. I don't know enough about how the the biology of crested crestless fireback to know how they how they behave. Um, but they're obviously not solitary, whereas some of the other birds, like the, the, the ground cuckoo, is 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 absolutely a solitary bird. 
Yeah, and, and before we move on from birds, I mean, BirdLife International, obviously one of the partners, um, quotes on their website that you've got 66 near threatened birds in uh, the reserve and also nine globally threatened birds. Um, so, you know, it, it's, you've got a lot of, sort of critically endangered mammals as well. So, you know, it really is an important project. Um, I mentioned to you before we started, I mentioned about the storm stalk and the, the bird, you know, BirdLife International Team Quarter has been in the region on the website. You say, however, that, you know, it's not really been seen for quite a few years. Is that right? Yeah, it's uh, storm stalk is probably the most um, critically endangered bird. Um, and it occurs in these remnants of forest. And certainly people were seeing this bird when we first uh, got the licenses and took over the concession. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know what it, what it is, it looks like a black stork. So it's black and white with red bill and legs, basically. Uh, it's quite a large bird, um, uh, but it's, um, it's pretty difficult to find. Uh, I've not seen one in, in the forest. Um, not I've spent much time looking, but uh, um, I don't think they've been seen very recently. Um, whereas, there's quite a range of other species of uh, of birds to so some of the babblers, the broadbills, the woodpeckers, these, you know, the, the ground dwelling pheasant types and so are, are much easier to come across if you sit quietly and watch and listen. Um, so, um, but I think the the interesting thing about the wildlife is that the birds are the you know the two bird organizations or three bird organizations are involved so we 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 kind of focus on the birds but actually it's some of the other things that are more interesting and yes. certainly more endangered so these are these are macaques and this particular species is the pig tailed macaque and you can see if you look at the rear of the one that's between the heads of the two facing us he's got a rather pig like tail that some of them they curl right up over the top of, of, of the back of the animal. These are um, quite widespread um, in the forest, very curious. You can see the two looking at us, are looking at a camera trap, and you can see another camera trap behind them on the tree. Yeah. And they will come and poke the trap and try and eat the trap and uh, or the, the, the actual camera thing and device and play around with it. But generally they'll they'll go away after a little while, but you do get some amazing images of them. Yeah, they look amazing. Again, you know, um, you know, an endangered species. Yeah, we've got about three, we think around 300 individual tapirs in the forest, um, which is quite you know, surprising. Um, if you think these are quite large animals, and they're very hard to see. You can see plenty of evidence they're there. I've seen loads of footprints. Never seen, never seen one um, that again you could see here. The, the images, uh, and, and if you look at the vegetation behind them, that vegetation is quite uh, is 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 not a. Um, you're not in a, 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 a sort of undisturbed bit of forest here. This has been quite heavily disturbed forest. So maybe on the edge of a track or something. Um, so these animals are capable of living in in you know, what was not their original primary forest. Mm. Interesting species. Yeah, it's yeah. A bit like our muntjac. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have uh, we have muntjac in. Uh, I've got I've got them round here, um, yeah. and uh, yeah, they are they are great little animals. But this is this is one in its natural habitat. Yeah, yeah. Um, now this is a this is a formidable beast. I I I have managed to see one of these. Um, this is a bearded pig, um, and um, these are the sorts of uh, so the muntjac and the pigs, the kind of things that the Batten Semberland might hunt. Um, they might you know in in the forest using spears. Um, and uh, this is this is quite a you know a, a, a scarce animal, but nevertheless pretty impressive. Yeah, uh, too great. The traps. I think our um, our mammal list because it's increasing as the as as time goes on. I think we're up to sixty four mammal species now. Oh right, right. And this one, um, so 
So obviously the camera trap is set to capture animals that roughly the height we expect them to be. And yeah. um, clearly this one has captured an elephant um, walking through the forest. Um, this, we're lucky to have this image because what we didn't know when we set the traps up for the first years was that the elephants react very badly to the flash. And this trap went off, the flash took the photo, the elephant found the trap and completely trashed it, broke the tree it was on, broke the trap to bits, broke the camera to bits, and we, this was the image, the only image we recovered from the, the card in the trap. So yes. we now know not to use the, um, not to use uh, flashes on our, on our camera traps. If it was needed, there are elephants there. That definitely yeah. <laughs> so we've, had, we've had, we think probably six female Asian elephants naturally occurring in the forest. They wander in and out in the in the uh, the, the southwest corner, which is a bit of the forest that, uh, that, that it, there's a bit that isn't entirely surrounded by palm oil. There's still some other forest out there, so they go out into that. Though they do go into the palm oil plantations as well. And um, in recent couple couple of years back, the uh, we were asked by the authorities if we would take. Uh, two so-called problem elephants from northern Sumatra. So these are elephants that are um, causing problems for local villagers going into crops, damaging houses and so forth. I mean, quite understandably in the sense that elephants are habitual and they wander around where they've always wandered around. If you put a crop in the way or a house in the way, they kind of ignore it and walk through it. So. So it's, it's understandable from the elephant's perspective. But anyway, the elephants, these two elephants were caught, uh, put in trucks and driven down south through Sumatra and brought to Hutan Harapan. And then they were carefully released with radio tracking collars on into the forest um, where there were already six females. And we are hoping that two things. One, that they'll cease being problematic because they'll be more interested in the females. And secondly, that we might have some young elephants in due course. Yeah, oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. So a couple, couple of species things. that people are not going to be sort of that familiar with now. So and maybe the one on the left a bit more so than the one on the right. Yeah, spotted civet is um, is is the animal uh, on on the left, and then the the dog, uh, hunting dog, wild dog, doe on the, on the other side. Um, I, I I did not, I would not have guessed that you'd get wild dogs in the forest, um, but you do. Uh, and uh, as you can see, these were taken at night, um, and uh, you know, it, it's 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 incredible how much wildlife is still there. Yeah, and uh, if I remember rightly from the BirdLife site, I think it was the BirdLife site, uh, you get some of the pangolin there, is that is that right? Yes, yes, the pangolin, um, one of the, the, there's quite a lot of, um, well, as I mentioned just now, we're, we're, we're learning all the time um, where the camera traps are forever turning up new species. So I think we're up to 60, 64 species of mammals, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, which is really quite amazing. We've got 126 species of reptiles and amphibians now, uh, largely because we've had people visiting who are really interested in, in the amphibians. I mean, there's 50, 55 species of amphibian alone, you know, which, is, which is largely people going out and finding frogs at night. Yes. Um, so quite a lot of this is quite specialist. Uh, in contrast, I have no idea what the butterfly species are in this forest. I don't think we've ever had a serious butterfly specialist come and look at that, or indeed the moths. So again, last uh, the regular discussions, they were we were talking about the uh, the hawk moths. I mean, there there'd be loads of interesting moths, but we we don't know what they are. So an awful lot still to be discovered. Yeah, yeah. And the, how's the pangolin sort of faring in, in that region? Because 
there's been lots in the news about sort of pangolin and sort of hunting of pangolin and you know how, how are they faring there do you know is that an unfair question because you weren't prepared for that one it's a it's a relevant question and i think the difficulty uh, we, we don't, the short answer is we don't know um the next bit of the answer is we fear that there are some people who come into the forest to collect animals and maybe birds as well so we think that there's some illegal activity going on and the challenge for us with a hundred thousand hectares mm. is to patrol it um, and we have to patrol it in day and night um, because some of the people will come in for these things at night because they're easier to find um, so uh, I don't know what the pangolin population is and I, I actually have I have no idea how you might establish uh, that um, so but we, we are worried that some of these uh, important and, and threatened animals are, are might be being exploited. Um, the evidence of that is obviously difficult to obtain, but um, it's something that we're mindful of. And our, we have our forest protection team you know, designed to try and prevent this from happening. Sure. So yes, here's another, another amazing animal um again i mean this is quite a large animal this is a sun bear it's quite a dangerous animal um it's it's uh, its defense if it's cornered is to rear up on its back legs and swipe out with its claws which are really i mean this this animal can climb trees so it's actually uh, got very strong claws so it's quite dangerous um so we've got a few of these in the forest um not not sure again how many they're, they're fairly infrequent visitors to the camera traps or caught by the camera traps the numbers are probably going to be quite low whereas things like tapirs as i say we, we think we've probably got over 300 tapirs in the forest so that they're they're actually quite a more or more conspicuous um and um i'm guessing that uh, the uh, final wonderful creature that you do find still in the forest is this magnificent beast this is the largest of the subspecies sorry the smallest of subspecies of the tigers the sumatran tiger um, stunning it is stunning and this uh, this is a, a a camera trap photo some of our staff have seen these tigers in you know for real not not through not through the, the camera traps so it is you do see them but it, they are very 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 elusive and this photograph was taken on a track that an hour earlier we had walked down so you can see it's on a track it's on yeah, an open track and we were walking through the forest and yeah. we the trap because we we saw it you know we saw it we heard it go off and uh, uh, and then you know 60 minutes later this magnificent beast walks down um interesting that i mean i would i it i don't find the idea frightening i would just love to go back and just hope that i might see it um the um we think you can you can identify tigers by their markings yeah uh, individual markings so we think we have around 20 tigers but we're not confident they're resident in the forest they they might be moving through into the palm oil and one of the th we've got wild boar in the palm oil, um, which are feeding on the palm oil, uh, on the on the fruits, of the palm oil. Um, so they're they're prolific, uh, and the tigers will probably find them quite easy prey. So we suspect that, ironically, the palm oil is providing the food for the the food for the prey of the tigers, and. Um, and uh, the tigers are moving through the forest and maybe hold up in the forest. They breed in the forest, but they're actually going out into the palm oil plantations at night to hunt. Um, but yes, there's a 20, 22 different individuals have been logged in the in the concessions. What a, I mean, what a beast. Uh, it is. I mean, you, you just, even though it's a sort of camera, uh, camera trap picture, you just look at the muscle formation on that front leg and you just, oh no, no that's, that's an immense creature, it's brilliant. So but yeah, I mean, it, you know, it looks like an amazing place, um, obviously an amazing job being done looking after it. 
Uh, there's a lot more we could have talked about. Um, we didn't even mention the fact that there's actually 600 tree species there, according to BirdLife's website. I'm sure there's a, a diversity of uh, other flora as well. Um, and, you know, we touched on moths and butterflies, but you can imagine that there'll be a huge range of, of all sorts of inverts there as well, which would be amazing. So I, who knows, maybe we'll get uh, Alan there and he can come over and do some moth trapping. So we, need, we need a team of people. I, our, I think we're up to 700 species of tree. Um, 700 trees. So, I mean, you know, it, it's just, uh, you just need one expert to come along and yeah. spend a few weeks and you'll, you'll probably double the total of whatever they're expert in. Um, it's only really the mammals and the birds that we've got to handle on the, on the, you know, the species diversity. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's just, a, just an incredible place. Yeah, and it's another example of, you know, there is still so much more to discover in the natural world. You know, we, we think we've seen everything. We'll never have seen everything. You know, there's just still so much to do. So I don't know, maybe one day I'll get over. I wish. Oh, it'd, be, it'd be great if we could invite people over. I mean, maybe one day after all this, uh, you know, restrictions and stuff has lifted that we you know we can start to get people to come and see these things it's so much easier to get motivated to protect something if you have some first-hand knowledge of what it looks like and what it is to be in it and and, and appreciate its beauty so uh, yeah fingers crossed yeah, exactly. And it's, it's the same with your community programs and, and the education programs. I, I harp on about it virtually every interview, but it, it's really close to my heart. You know, if you know, if you educate people about an area, if you educate them about what their surroundings are, and, you know, what shares them surroundings with them, um, then they're going to sort of care for it because they'll understand it. If they don't understand it, then they're not going to care for it. So, you know, that part of any project in including your own is is just amazing and you know it's, it's more of it please from other projects yeah. so it's been great talking to you thank you ever so much for your time thank you it's been a pleasure enjoyed it i don't many people don't say it's a pleasure talking to me <laughs> i normally talk to them a lot so but thank you ever so much tim it's um it's really good of you to give us some some of your time and I'll leave you now to still not so sunny Norfolk and a bit more breezy and the odd shower. So I'll leave you to that and maybe we'll speak again in the future. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot, Tim. Take care. Goodbye. Bye.